<laughs> you know, one of the things Fred and I, uh, just jumping right in here, you know, Fred and I discussed this a, a week and a half ago uh, about uh, having this discussion where we were able to talk about uh, race, the recent uh, racial, uh, or the recent uh, uh, killing of a young black man in Brunswick, Georgia. Uh, and then, you know, when we began talking about this, one of my fears was that the further we push this back, you know, and you, we had talked about doing it this week, that um, I don't know what the term would be for it, uh, irrelevance, or, or that wouldn't be really the right term because it's always relevant to talk about subjects like this. Um, but I think it will get out of the mainstream news, news like it has, but not knowing that Monday, a gentleman by the name of George Floyd will lose his life um, with a knee to his neck and be suffocated by the police force there. And, um, and so it's something that uh, we have, you know, uh, looked at talking about subjects like this and focusing on this because I know, Fred, that when you and I talked about this, um, it'd be a great conversation to have leaders from various backgrounds like ourselves uh, from different backgrounds, different, uh, you know, different backgrounds, different racial backgrounds, different, different upbringings, be able to come and, and, and bring our um, voices to this. And one of the things over the last 24 hours that I have seen is uh, being able to see the grieving that has taken place uh, by many families, uh, mothers, uh, brothers, uh, uh, men, women uh, are, are, are grieving profusely. Um, the things that people are putting on their social media to let people know their feelings. Uh, and, and I think that you cannot not have conversations, but yet they're still being avoided from being having true, honest conversations about matters like this. And so I, I kind of want to open up this conversation, first of all, saying welcome to you all. Thank you so much for joining on this. Um, before I go delve in first, because I really want to turn to Fred as well as Dr. McGraw, I want to turn to both of you all first, but I would like for all of us uh, just kind of share a little bit about ourselves. I know this will first be placed on Living Waters. I'm the pastor at Living Waters International Church in Riverdale, Georgia, which is in South Atlanta in the metro area there. Um, and 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 everyone, the last time that we met physically in our building before the virus, Fred was with us at Living Waters International Church, and basically it closed us out, closed the place down. <laughs> and so it was, uh, it was a tremendous time. Dr. McGraw, you were there that day. I just, I, something historical happened that day, if I could just brag, that you came before the church and said you wanted to build, uh, uh, build a widow's hut. Uh, and, and Africa and do that and immediately a check came in for the amount of money needed to build that uh, mm -hmm. uh, from a couple in our church and it just astounded both of us and we got that on video it's just it's phenomenal um, a phenomenal time that we had there uh, but I know that Fred is well known at Living Waters International Church uh, and is an evangelist uh, that travels not only around the country but also around the world um, evangelizing and speaking at many churches and ministries and events across the nation and around the world. Fred, would you like to say anything else uh, regarding your introduction, regarding oh, this you, or anything else? You did a great job. I, I, I wish I could have recorded it. it <laughs> well, it is being recorded. We are recording. So we'll send this little clip to you. <laughs> yes, please do. But I'm just excited to be with uh, definitely brothers that I love and each of you I know on a very uh, personal, personal basis. Yeah. And some years ago, the Lord laid on my heart to uh, put together something uh, dealing with racism and the church, how the church can move uh, to unity, being one, how through our unity we can uh, share and show, you know, the glory of God, not understanding these things would be happening, then also uh, doing uh, workshops and training with uh, churches and leaders on the area of, of diversity what is diversity, why we need diversity, and how we benefit from diversity. Yeah. So I just think myself and all of us, and those who are watching, that we are born for such a time as this. And so I'm excited of the things we're gonna share, the things that I'm gonna learn uh, from you all. So thank you so much for having me. Ray, why don't you uh, introduce us also to your friend, Pastor McCrane, as well as your spiritual father, Dr. McGraw. I'd love for you to introduce them. Well, I, I won't do as good a job as you did, but I'll, I'll do my best. 
I start with Pastor Crane. I've known Pastor Crane for many years. He is truly uh, a brother from another mother. Uh, he has a great church in uh, Bushnell, Florida, uh, that is making a difference not only locally, but literally uh, globally. And Pastor Crane is definitely being used by God uh, internationally as well. And he is just truly a people's pastor. And he is genuine. What you see is what you get. And Dr. McGraw, which is my spiritual father, uh, he has seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. As it relates to me, he has spoken into my life and still speaks into my life. He is a father of fathers. He definitely has a prophetic uh, voice and mantle upon his life. And the Lord is using him not only to raise up sons, but to release sons to the nations. And I believe that the best is yet to come for him in this season uh, because this mantle that God has placed upon his life is being multiplied into churches and into hearts of people across America and around the world. You know, we're in a sensitive time. Was that good? Was that good, yeah. guys? Was that okay? Perfect. perfect. I wish I would have recorded that. <laughs> I, wish, I, I wish I could say this. I wish I could say such good things about myself. <laughs> Well, you know, we're we're at we, you know we're we're in a sensitive time right now in our nation once again, and and I think it would be wise to open it up to hear from your heart, uh, Fred, and your heart as well, Dr. McGraw, from your standpoint, uh, because I don't think that many people in the nation, most of the nation, knows what happens to families and individuals uh, when something like this that had ha has happened over the last what 48 hours uh, takes place, uh, not only in your heart and your mind, but also in your home. Would you elaborate on that and share that? Well, first I'd like for us to, uh, if I could, let's just open in prayer. Would we, could we please? Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. McGraw, go ahead. Okay, and then Fred can take it from there as he opens up. And so yes, Father, sir. we come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Thank Christ, giving thanks but first of all, for our relationship with you, that we can call upon your name yes. because we have given access to your throne room through the blood and flesh of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, God, as we deal with an issue that is prevalent in our nation, and I know it is seriously on your heart, for you have called us to be one, even as you and your son and the spirit of is one. And so we pray your blessing for our time together as you know each and every one of us to communicate in such a way that will touch the hearts of the listeners that change will truly occur. We give you thanks in advance for the transformation, the renewing of our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I know for me, my uh, family and I, as we try to do on a regular basis, we have what we call family devotion, time amen. of family prayer, just talking, discussing, and then we close out with a scripture. And so I was led last night, literally last night, to, uh, before we pray and read the word, just to get a temperature of how everyone was feeling. Uh, my son, Keenan, uh, just graduated from my alma mater. It was called North Central Bible College in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It is now North Central. And literally uh, what taken place was five minutes away where he graduated from school and where I went to school. And so we are both very familiar with that area. And so as we were going around the room, uh, my wife spoke first, then my daughter spoke, uh, and, then, then, and then my son spoke. And many of you know my son, and he's uh, 21 years old. And he literally said these words. He said, Dad, I'm afraid. Dad, I'm afraid. 21 years old, educated. Uh, has a mom and a dad living in the United States of America saying, Dad, I'm afraid. And so this is our reality. Conversations of you respond when you get pulled over by a cop. Here are the do's and don'ts. I did it when he was 15, 14, and I'm still doing that even today. And my dad is telling me, and I'm 50, 
none of your business years old. And, he's, <laughs> and, and, my, and my dad is still telling me these things. And so I just want to end with saying that uh, my heart is that more of our white brothers and sisters would bring their voice and join it to our voice in reference to, to these matters. Dr. McGraw? Well, this, the things that are happening within our nation are um, creating a number of different things. And what Fred has spoken about uh, was about the fear within the African-American male, especially. Now this happens, some of these things happen to females as well, as you know, but the African-American male has been primarily the target of what I believe is the enemy. Because remember, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're sure. wrestling against spiritual powers of wickedness and principalities in high places. And so this attack has been upon, upon the African-American male. Now, the consequences of that, as you realize, uh, through history, we have discovered and through our statistics that whenever there's an African-American male missing from the family, the family structure is basically destroyed and the males that are produced by that come out dysfunctional. And so right. the enemy knows exactly what he's doing. And, and the challenge that we are confronted with, I believe, is that how can we overcome this, uh, particularly those who are in authority? How can we overcome this? What can we do? Uh, what can we start to implement in order to begin to offset what the enemy is doing? And it's very important for us to know our enemy. Our enemy is not the police force. That's, un that's sad because the enemy is using the police force and the people in the police force, but not all of them are doing the same thing. So there's a number of dynamics that need to be looked at and discussed and put out there. And I think the main thing, uh, Pastor Roland, uh, listen, is this. We got to get this on the table. And I like what Fred has started doing and traveling around and giving those uh, basically workshops and seminars to put this on the table. That's what really needs to happen. And so I was very, very pleased when you reached out to me to ask to uh, me to communicate and be a part of this, this if you will, this panel. Uh, because there are some things on my heart. Uh, as an executive presbyter and the first African-American to be elected in the Potomac Ministry Network, which is over 103 years old now, uh, they, they, I was elected 14, well, more than 14 years ago now, but served for 14 years as both a presbyter and then an executive presbyter, the only African-American voice on the table with all of the men and the leadership for that network of 300 plus churches. And so um, it has been a unique opportunity that God has afforded me uh, to be able to not only hear the hearts of my, if I can say, Caucasian brothers, uh, but also uh, to, to actually give voice to some of the issues that we were confronted with within our network, our district at that time. And so um, we need to do something, and I, need, I think we need to do something now. Pastor Crane, when, when Fred was sharing with me about you, and I said, well, tell me a little bit about Pastor Crane. What, why, why would you want him to come and be on this panel? And he said this, because wherever he leads, it's open to everybody, you know? And, and share your heart today, not only about just the current events, but also your heart regarding the matters that are facing our country, uh, regarding uh, racial reconciliation uh, and peace in our nation. Yeah. Um, first, I appreciate the opportunity to be on today and, and uh, respect and great to hear the voice of Dr. McGraw and, of course, my friend uh, Fred Felton and, and their hearts. Uh, I, I want to just key on something that Dr. McGraw said, and I think it's, it, it is so key, is that, um, that we have to keep in mind at the root of all of this is the, the enemy is not flesh and blood, but it is in, indeed uh, the forces of Satan that are, that are coming against uh, everyone in, in whatever way they're coming against. Of course, they were talking about this, uh, about racism, and it's such a, um, uh, a difficult thing, because as Dr. McGraw said, there's so many facets to it that makes it, it, makes it um, 
a, a challenge to to address. For me, I think it has to start in a very uh, in a very basic vein and realize that um, you know we we live in a nation now uh, several hundred years old. We have more laws on the book than you can than you could ever name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Relations than you could ever change, and yet we're still having these conversations because it's really not a matter of law; it's a matter of the heart. Absolutely, and the heart shifts until that changes. It's not; it's not going to be solved. I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't add laws. If there's a place where the law is deficient, it definitely should be added. And um, and 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 where there's places where policy and procedure need to be addressed and changed, it obviously needs to be changed. But none of that is going to ultimately affect it until the heart of people change. And of course, that's the work of the church. We're, we're in the heart uh, changing business and to see people's hearts change. And then Amen. just maybe another avenue where that's concerned is, you know, and, and I'm just going to maybe um, borrow a little bit from what I think is going to be with the situation in Minneapolis. Uh, when, when these uh, officers respond, more than likely, what we're going to hear from their lawyers is that they're saying that they acted within policy, they acted within procedure, they acted within their rights, all those kinds of things, and it totally ignores their moral responsibility. It totally ignores what makes sense. It totally ignores what they should be doing from their heart. And, and for me, that's, that, that is another issue that has to be addressed in our nation, is it isn't about my... Uh, from that police officer's point of view, it's, it's my right to do this. He mm -hmm. has to he has to have some some sensibility that says this is just wrong. I, I can't do this to another human being. This is wrong, regardless mm -hmm. of what the policy and procedure says. If I may piggyback, if you don't mind, no, go ahead. It, yes, you're right on point, my pastor, uh, because. Heart change is really ultimately what had to happen, not only the responsibility of the church, but also what had to happen to each of us individually. Right. Yeah. Romans sure. 1 and 2 talks about the key to changing the heart is actually begins with the renewing of the mind. Mm -hmm. And see, once the mind is renewed, then you're no longer conform to the world, which is what's happening with these officers. You know, they hear about these sort of things and they see that their counterparts are getting away with it. It's just the enemy using those thoughts and minds in their minds, and as a result of that, and their, until their minds are renewed, they will not be transformed. They will be conforming to the ways of this world, right. and they will not be transformed to prove God's perfect, acceptable will. And so um, I, I had the opportunity of being on the board uh, to address some issues that I think were really, really relevant and I really thank God for the superintendent that I had at that time, Reverend Ken Bertram, uh, because whenever one of these issues came up, he would do a letter to address all of the pastors in the network. And he would run that letter by me before he published it in order to make sure that there was nothing inflammatory against the African-American in his letter that would cause them to react to it in any negative way. And uh, he operated with such wisdom. And so it was, it was so important for us to recognize something and he recognized it right away. See, I think that there are two key issues here. Number one, ignorance. You see, there's an ignorance to the sensitivities of the African-American to the things that are happening to, not them personally, but to their counterparts or relatives or friends, whatever, in, the, in America. And so there's an ignorance on the part of those who are, if you will, my, my Caucasian brothers, to recognize how sensitive we are to conversations you might have about it, the things that might be done or not done, and how you take a stand one way or another on this on these issues and so you have to recognize that they're 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 walking around if you will with a chip on their shoulders okay they already got the chip there so if you don't recognize that any little spark is going to set it off and some of the things we saw posted on facebook the cursing and everything my wife and i was looking at last night it just 
crazy, but it's, it's a reaction because there's a chip there. And soon as anything happens, I'm really, uh, really concerned. Uh, I, I like what your son said, Fred, but about being afraid, but I'm concerned of the explosiveness. Uh, I looked at the video today that happened there in that protest in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And so, man, it was, it was horrific. It was taking me all the way back. See, I grew up in the 60s, and it took me back to the race riots and all of those kind of crazy things that took back took place back then. And so I'm, I'm here to tell you that I, I'm not going to use the word I'm afraid, but I'm, I'm concerned that this is really uh, explosive right now. We have an explosive time period. Unless we do something rather quickly to avert some of these things and to educate, I think that's the second part of it. Ignorance is eliminated by education, by the renewal of the mind. So we got to talk about these actions that this ignorance and why you're not aware of why you're not sensitive up to where we are and what we're thinking and how we're feeling about various things and various subjects when you bring it up. The second thing is the failure. The failure on the part of those in authority. See, this, this has to happen in the church. We're really the authority in the earth realm. If, if God was to rapture us now, we would really see the devil take control, okay? So because we're here, we're holding back the forces of darkness and evil right now because of the church. So the authority lies in the church. Therefore, it is the church that must take the lead in re-education, re-indoctrination, helping people to understand from each other's parts. See, that's what God talks to us about, how you build a house. In Proverbs 24, he says in verse 3, you know, you build it on wisdom, then you establish it by, English, by understanding, and then you get knowledge in that order. Because without those things, the house will be destroyed from within. And that's where our real issues are. They're within. They're the heart issues from within. The house, my personal house, the house of the Lord, all of that has to deal with, be dealt with with wisdom. We're seeking to understand. I teach this all the time. Seek first to understand others, and then you will be understood. You see, the challenge is that we want everybody to understand us. And so, you know, but what we really need to do is try to understand others. And when, when we do that, we're always going to be blessed on the back end. There's an interesting passage in 1 Peter 3, 7 that we've often used in marriages. But I want to draw if we will, a point to that, because I think it's a little bit of analogy there. Uh, it talks to the man, and it says that he needs to look at his wife as the weak vessels. Now, we know some of these women can beat their husband, but okay. <laughs> so, so, we're not talking about physical strip. He's looking at her from an emotional point, point of view and her weakness because of her emotions. And he says to the man, you have to take the lead. So those in authority must take the lead, if you will, in seeking to understand, dwell with your wife with understanding, and look at the promise that he says, oh man, this is a powerful promise, that is, we're going to be blessed to live the grace of this life when we understand each other. And then secondly, our prayers will be answered. And so if we, the, those in authority in the church, man, pastors, let it start there in the grassroots. Um, the influences of the pastors are the district leaders and in, in, in the assemblies of God, uh, if I'm speaking of the assemblies of God right now. The district leaders, the national leaders, seeking to understand, seeking to provide educational things to re-education, creating the platform, bringing individuals on, those weaker vessels, if you will, the African-American pastors, to bring them in, let them speak and have the, that voice and have that freedom to speak about their sensitivities. And if there's gonna be tears, there's gonna be some brokenness to occur. There was a recent video that I, I don't know if any of you got it on message, but I did, a pastor at a church called Victory Church washed the feet of an African-American boy. And I'm telling you, uh, that was a powerful message. Uh, someone sent it to me yesterday and I, I listened to it. It was just powerful. The church stood up and applauded. It was a multicultural, multiracial church. And he, a white pastor, took the lead as the stronger one, the person in authority, so to speak, to reach down 
to help and to bless this man and try to bring about some understanding. So um, these two issues, I think, really need to be addressed. Number one, the issue of our heart, the ignorance that we walk in in our race relationships. And then secondly, the things that we have to motivate our leaders to take the lead in this area and so they get, it really gets down to the grassroots, the people in our congregations. And that's how change is going to occur within our nation. And uh, Fred started this already with uh, going around with these workshops, but uh, you know, it's got to be repeated because repetition is one of the major place forms of learning. So thank you so much for allowing me to share. Fred, do you want to add? Yeah, I just think even now, uh, Pastor Crane had lunch at one of our favorite restaurants. He knows where it is. And I think about the conversations being you have had, Pastor Jason, about these topics and other topics. And I think that word began is that we need to create a safe place where we can talk and share, yeah. ask questions, even if it's maybe one may think a foolish question or an ignorant question, yeah. but to feel safe enough uh, with the brother in faith to ask the question. And one brother asked me, a white brother, he said, why are there black colleges? He didn't know. Mm -hmm. He didn't know. And thank God for a relationship where he can ask an honest question. Yeah. so that he can get the right information, education, get understanding of how things are and how they came to be. And yeah. so this right here, as Dr. McGraw mentioned, uh, on a grassroots level, on a leadership level, uh, we need to have these kinds of discussions, not talking uh, to one another, but talking with one another and listening uh, to one another, I think yeah. is the beginning of moving forward in presenting the world what the body of Christ looks like, what the family of God looks like. So these kinds of discussions will move us in the right direction. Now, Dr. McGraw, you said that, uh, well, before I go there, uh, Pastor, Mc Pastor Crane, do you have anything you want to add to that? I, I was just going to say uh, I, what Fred said there about relationship, I think is absolutely key. Uh, when, when your relationship with someone um, a person may say something and, and it's going to, it's going to, um, you're going to process it differently when your relationship with them than if you, if you don't know the person. Yes. Uh, so for example, even, and of course, a whole nother wild, uh, aspect of all of this is social media and the inflammatory nature of it and all those kinds of things. But the reality is I can read a post on Facebook that's written by a friend and because I know them in a relationship with them, I'll take it completely different than when somebody writes something. And, I'm, and, and the first question in my mind is, where are they coming from? What are they trying to say? What are they, you know? And, and so I think re relationship is huge. And so I think that's where that grassroots level is so important because I can have impact in my church because I've, I have relationship there. Absolutely. And, and, and they're going to listen to me and they're going to receive it from me more so than they are going to, or, or somebody that I bring in, they're going to, they're going to receive it from them better because they either has my endorsement or it's coming from me because I've built relationship. Yes, sir. Let, let, me, ask, let me ask this question because I, I think that this can begin a conversation to help people understand a little bit about what the feeling is right now. Dr. McGraw, you talked about looking at, at what's going on there and the, the rioting, the anger, uh, the the madness, the the anger that's going on there, uh, and you said you said they have a chip on their shoulder. Help people understand, people not of color, to understand what that chip consists of, to help us better understand that chip that you said they're coming with. Help us understand that, because I don't think a lot of people do understand there are there are incidents after incidents that has built up to this time and people are tired and they want this to be the last time, but yet it happens again. You know, we thought, we thought three weeks ago that could have been the last incident yet something else happens. And, and, and now we're at another incident and another life has been taken. Can you explain to the, to those who say, you know, why, why are you so angry? Help understand that. 
Well, <laughs> I'm glad you asked. So, so let me just say this, first of all. Do you know, has anybody ever thought about the number of um, white or Caucasian men who have been equally brutalized? Mm -hmm. It's never talked about. Never talked about. Why? See, that's where the why begins, because you see, when you talk about an African-American and the sensitivity and why they have all of the sensitivity, it goes all the way back to the roots of slavery, bro. It goes all the way back. And so uh, the African-American has a history that is constantly thrown in their faces in different ways through media, social networks, everything. History that goes back where our African-American history wasn't even taught in schools. And so there's a lot of different things that that have built up this thing. So that there is so built up in their heart, the lynchings that occurred back then, the way people were treated, uh, you see it in movies, it shows up again in the movie. And so then you, you see in this stuff always thrown in your face. And so then what happens is that your mind begins to eternalize these things and, and your heart becomes full with this kind of uh, anger. Uh, I, personally, I have a son that I have been really praying and working with because he has really taken a lot of this personally uh, because of not only what has happened in the past, it didn't happen to him, didn't happen to his dad, it, it didn't happen to my father, really, but it happened to my grandfather, okay? And so uh, these things are being thrown in his faces as he goes to various conferences where he sits down with an African-American doctor who talks about these issues and, and pushing uh, this, this black unity. And so it's really a challenging time for me and him because I have to really seek the Lord on how I respond to those situations. But I, I think if, the, if you're asking uh, for helping people to understand you need to think about what the African-American has had to deal with for centuries, going back to the 1800s, the 1600s, and talking about what they've had to deal with all of these years, and then how that is still being thrown in their faces through the media. Who controls this stuff? Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And that's how all this stuff is communicated. And so it continues to reopen the wound, the wound, and so therefore there's a chip. And every little incident that occurs, even though there are some incidents occurring with other nationalities, you don't hear about them. You don't hear about them. They're not so bluntly thrown in your face. But as soon as something happens to the African American, oh, it's a real issue because of what is happening. It's agenda. It's a, it's a demonic agenda. I know sometimes people tell me, Pastor, <laughs> that I'm a little bit too spiritual, but I'm sorry. I'm not going to be apologizing for that because I know the truth. The truth is we're dealing with a spiritual agenda of the enemy, and he wants to divide this country. That's what he really wants to do because how is anything destroyed from within? Uh, Pastor Green, Brett, anybody want to add to that? Yeah, I, I, Dr. McGraw, I, I just appreciate your heart, and, and that's so powerful. I, I think when, when you hear it from, th when I hear it from that perspective, one of the, it, what, what came in my mind was when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment in the law? He, he doesn't even quote one of the Ten Commandments that, that you know, that we're, that we're fighting to have on courthouses, on the side of courthouses. He, right. he quotes from the, uh, from the Shema, he says, it's to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, all your strength. The second one's like that. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right. And, and, and for me, a large part of this begins right there is, 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 is the church demonstrating and teaching, preaching, and showing authentic love. And, and when we begin to do that, when we, when, and, and, you know, Lord help me. I know there's times that I don't do it, and and I I want to be to be better at that. 
that the Bible says love covers a multitude of sin. And, and when we get to that place that that love is being uh, uh, visibly demonstrated, I really feel like we have to come to that place that we have that faith that it really can counteract what, what is being controlled by the prince of the power of the air that, you know, we're not, we're never going to be able to have the platform that the major news outlets have that continuously run these 24 hour news cycles and, and causes people to spike in their emotions. And, right. and I, take it away from this. I, I made a decision about four or five weeks ago to quit watching any news about the coronavirus thing, because it just, I, I couldn't take it. It was, it was, it was literally getting in my mind, uh, mm -hmm. working on my faith, and, and I just couldn't watch it. And, That's right. And, and, and I, I, I wasn't, I, don't get me wrong, I stayed, I, I, I looked at enough news to know what was going on, but all the stuff, the, the political agenda, the social agenda, all that stuff, I got away from that because I couldn't, I just, I myself couldn't process it. And, and so I think it's the same way with this kind of stuff, uh, this, this particular issue is that we have to, we have to quiet the, the noise in our own heart and focus on the kingdom principle of love God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your strength. And then uh, yeah. when we see the specific aspects of that issue that comes up, like, like this thing in Minneapolis, this tragic thing in Minneapolis, we address it from a kingdom principle and, and uh, from the principles of the kingdom and when we do that, I, I, I really believe it's not going to happen in a moment. It's not going to happen in a week. It's going to be a process of change. The, the scripture that you quoted from Romans 12, the renewing of the mind, the, the idea that it's a process, it's not something that's going to happen. Right. You know, I grew, up, I grew up in a Pentecostal church and everything was supposed to magically happen just like that, you know, and, <laughs> and it don't always happen that way. No, no. <laughs> Brent? Thank you so much. I was just thinking, um, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but I really like hockey. I like hockey so much. Before I wanted to play baseball, I wanted to be a hockey player. Really? But, one, but that was one problem. I couldn't stand up on the ice. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I had the privilege of speaking in um, Ontario. And during one of the off days, uh, somehow – was just doing some uh, reading about about hockey, how it began, and who were some of the beginners of it, reference to the uh, NHL, and come to find out that the uh, some of the original hockey players was the CHL, and the CHL was before the NHL, and the CHL was the Colored Hockey League. You can do really? that. Wow. The Colored Hockey League came wow. before the NHL. Wow. A lot of the ideas and skills that the NHL did, they took from the CHL, the Colored Hockey League. And one of the myths or the lies that kept colored hockey players out of the NHL back then, the two lies were, number one, uh, their legs aren't strong enough. <laughs> the oh. legs aren't strong enough. Okay. And secondly, the second myth was that they don't like cold weather. Now, just me, I know a lot of white people that don't like cold weather either. Come on, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think this this is kind of what Dr. McGraw and Pastor Craig have been talking about. This is the narrative mm -hmm. the story mm -hmm. that have passed around for centuries that have been passed around through our families, through society, even through some of our churches and our educational uh, institutions. Mm. And so again, I cannot stress enough, by us talking, by us learning, by us, by us praying, because Jesus showed us both spiritual and natural. He ate natural and he prayed spiritual. So we want to make sure that we engo, engage both elements because we are spirit, soul, and body. And yes. so this has just been a, a, a blessing to me. I'm really starting to see uh, what God wants to do 
And this is an opportunity for the people of God, not the people of the world, because they do not know Jesus. They do not have the spirit of Christ in them, the Holy Spirit. But this is an opportunity for the body of Christ, not just in America, but, but worldwide to come together and to show the world what unity looks like. And so this, this is great. This is really blessed. What, what um, Fred, with you traveling so much, uh, and, and is anybody on the time limit today? I mean, do we have to get off at a certain time for anyone's schedule uh, today? Because uh, I, I got to be done by five. Other than uh, that, I'm good. We'll be done way for then. <laughs> you could be here at five. <laughs> you know, church, uh, Fred, you, you travel to church. You know, church is teaching on recon ra racial reconciliation and racial understanding. What is the thing that you want the church to know because of things that you have experienced or seen or heard uh, in the church in your travels? What, what are the things that you want the church to know? Uh, because I, I believe among a lot of, this is my thought, among a lot of Caucasian leaders, it's always the thought that they have the problem, not me. Mm -hmm. You know, but sometimes, and, I, and, I, and I'll, I'll piggyback on this, and this is something that has haunted me for the last four months of, of reading this out of a book, that Jesus can change your heart, but he can't change grandfather being in your bones. Mm. And so with us is that we have generations inside of us and mm. things that we learned as children or taught as children now carry on to us as adulthood. And so the thought patterns, unless we, unless we can get those thought patterns and break them and put on a renewed mindset, those thought patterns are still the same. What would you want, uh, you know, if you could say, let's, let's talk to church leaders first, but also to Caucasian church leaders. And then I would like to reverse it. If we could somehow to turn back to myself as well as Pastor Crane uh, of, of, of just asking us some questions, kind of just doing a small dialogue here, you know, of, of what, what, what could the church's church leaders know that you have seen, experienced in the church that you go, I just want leaders to know this one or two things. Thank you. Um, it reminds me of a conversation I had with a pastor and uh, right outside Miami over, again, over breakfast. Mm -hmm. And he was asking me, why is there anger? Why is it uh, Blacks always talking about racial things? And I explained to him, and we were sitting under the table. If you kept kicking me on my leg the first few times, you know, I, I might ignore it, you know, not as mm -hmm. much, it's an accident. But if you keep kicking me, I'm going to say something. I may say, stop. I may move my leg. I may say, oh, you're kicking my leg. You know, we say it nice and pleasant, you know, with a smile. But if you keep kicking my leg, and I'm telling you, you're kicking my leg and it's hurting me. You're hurting me, you're not stopping, you're not adjusting uh, your legs or uh, where you're sitting at. I'm not going to respond nice and calm. I'm gonna respond in a more aggressive and loud manner because, that, because of the continued pain. And that's what Dr. McGraw was sharing about. There's been centuries upon centuries of not being heard. And so for me, what I would bring to a, a pastor or a leader, and this may sound controversial, but I would say, number one, we are all guilty. I want that to sink in a little bit. I know maybe somebody watching wasn't expecting that, but we're all guilty. Let me explain what I mean very shortly. I meant to say, or rather the reason why I said that was because a pastor called and said, Fred, I want to apologize for the time I was silent. I should have spoken up. I didn't say anything. So I want to apologize. Forgive me. And then in return, I said, forgive me for being angry. Forgive me for being upset. Forgive me for holding bitter against you for not speaking up for me. You see, the world hear us say, we're the body of Christ. 
the world hears us say we are a part of the family of God. But they see how we treat one another. Mm -hmm. So what I would like to bring at the table on both sides is an opportunity for black and white people to both have a safe place where we can both ask the other to forgive me for how we have responded with this thing called racism. Anybody, one of you guys want to add to that? Go ahead, Pastor Crane. Uh, I, I, I love what uh, Fred said there about, um, you know, he, he's saying, forgive me and um, both, si both sides of the conversation being able to say that. I think that's so powerful and so important. Uh, I have a, a pastor for, uh, friend here in town, uh, uh, Jermaine Gordon, he pastors uh, uh, a mostly African American church, and of course, my church is 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 mostly a Caucasian church. But he and I are good friends, and we do events together. And um, in, in fact, we even uh, at least once a year we'll switch pulpits. I'll preach at his church; he'll preach at my church on the same Sunday. And he and I are just good friends. We talk on the phone um, uh, 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 several times uh, from time to time. Anyway, we're good friends. And um, when we first started doing this pulpit swap, swap thing, he, he was saying to me, he was saying, this is a historic event. And, and in my mind, I was like, we're just, we're just changing pulpits. It's, in, in my mind, it wasn't, a historic, it wasn't a historic event. You know, it was, it, was, it was a cool idea, but it wasn't a historic event. And it goes back to what uh, something that Dr. McGraw said, it finally hit me. I was thinking about it from my perspective. I wasn't thinking about it from his perspective. Yeah. And, 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 and it was his perspective that that's what it was. And, and, and it really changed the way I approached the, the entire, uh, the entire um, event because I began to see it, not from the way I saw it, but from the, at least the beginning of the way he saw it. Yeah, and, sure. and, and, and so I think that's absolutely important to be able to see that. And then, once we begin to kind of internalize or at least identify our own side of it, uh, somebody said s something in my church a number of years ago that, and, and you all may have he heard something similar to this, but it was so impactful to me in, 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 in its implication. He said this, he said, if you're in a conflict with someone and you're 10% uh, wrong, 30% wrong, whatever it is, he said, if you could assign a percentage to it, he said, say if you're just 10% wrong, you're 100% responsible for your 10%. And you can be 0% responsible for the other person's 90%, you know? And so I think, I think that's the concept is once I realize there's something in me that needs to shift, I need to work on that and not point my fingers at others and say, well, if they wouldn't have done this, or if they wouldn't have said this, or if they didn't have this attitude, or if they didn't do that, and, 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 and just like uh, uh, Fred was saying is, you know, uh, when, when you think of why, why is, why is uh, this person angry? Why is, it, why is it the African-American person angry? Instead of looking at it from that and trying to, trying to say, well, there, there shouldn't be that way or whatever the case may be, that I look at this and what have I contributed to this? What have I done to, to make this a reality and begin to address that in my own life. That's good. That's good. It is good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things, if I can share a story with you all too, and I, I think I've shared this on Fred on many of our numerous breakfasts <laughs> and lunches and dinners, <laughs> especially at <the> Outback. <laughs> That's our place to go when you're in Atlanta. <laughs> uh, and this first time I ever shared this publicly on a public platform. I've shared it many other times. Uh, but even with Dr. McGraw here, sharing it because of, of the position and office that he held in the Potomac District. Uh, I, I would tell you how I am today in 2020 is different than I was in probably 2014. Uh, with everything going on in the nation and mm -hmm. the conversations I've had since then, a lot of things have changed in my life. One of the things that our previous superintendent uh, did uh, was he desired and sent out a letter uh, for the first time in the history of our uh, district 
and, and for those who are not uh, in the same fellowship of that we are, but we're all ministers of the same fellowship, which is the Assemblies of God. Uh, and he desired to put an African American, uh, create an, a presbytery for the African American uh, presbyter there. Mm -hmm. And he sent out a letter uh, to them. And for those that don't know me, I am in an interracial, interracial marriage, and all my children are biracial. And so with that, but when I got that letter, I was not happy about it. And it wasn't for racial reasons, not at all. The reason I wasn't happy about it, because I thought that the men and women that made up our district was uh, higher than that, and that we, we didn't need to do such things, that it should come out of the abundance of our heart. You know, and, and the thing about that is, is that we, we all are like that. You know, we, we are like that. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I did was, and I was going to write a letter to the superintendent <laughs> because I reckon I thought I had, <laughs> I thought I had a right to, you know, but I didn't. And thank goodness I didn't. But it's a powerful story I share today. <laughs> thank goodness I didn't. <laughs> but I don't think I've ever shared this with him either. Uh, and, and I didn't have any grievance. I like, I didn't have a problem with what he was doing. Because I, I, what I had a problem, I just thought that we were, that 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 the that the people that made up our district should come out, should do this on their own, that that we should. But I brought in one Sunday morning. I brought in many of my leaders, all of them African American leaders, into my office, and I told them my thoughts about this, and I I wanted their opinion, what they thought, and they all thought what a great idea. They thought that it was a great way for the district to move forward racially. Then I got pricked because, you know, as pastors, we know things that everybody else don't know. And I started thinking, well, you know, our superintendent knows everybody, you know? And so, you know, and I may not know everybody and what's on everybody's heart, you know? And so I became a big cheerleader for this and eventually voted for it, you know? But even in my mind, you know, I thought, and it wasn't a racial issue. It was just, you thought you're looking at the times we're we're beyond all of this, you know, think, you know, we're, we're, beyond, we're, we're better people than this. We should do this on our own. But the thing is, sometimes it takes an initiative in order to move an organization forward in making those hard moves. And, and it's something that Dr. McGraw, you're here because you did fulfill that role for, fulfill that role for the Potomac District. Yes. But, but I, I, you know, I think I shared that maybe with, with Fred uh, about that on a, on a previous dinner or a luncheon that we had. Um, it's just because, I, but, but I, was, I, I was more surprised by my leaders and how they applauded that. They thought it was such a great idea because it allowed the organization to move forward. It, it was able to, to, to break us go forward in an area that, that probably, if that would not have been done, it still will probably be years and years and years. And I'm so proud of our district because we grow racially in all backgrounds, red and yellow, black and white. You know, we, we, we're all, you know, growing in all different areas and, and represented in all nationalities and things like that. But it really takes that sometime push to, to move a organization for us to even break down those racial barriers in order to do that. Would y'all like to comment on that? Well, I'd like to make a, a observation because uh, I was really shocked, I must admit, when I visited uh, another Assembly of God church here uh, while we were trying to find our niche and find the church that's going to be our church home. And so um, the pastor was addressing that very subject. Mm -hmm. and he was dealing with, uh, and, and Fred had spoken at that church, and that's how I actually went there the first time, supporting Fred. And then, and so the pastor dealt with the racial issues that were prevalent in his church and in the county. And, mm -hmm. and he, and I'm, let me say this, since we've been here, and the reason we came here was because every experience that we've had over the years of coming to conferences and whatnot, to Atlanta was always a good one. Always. You know, and don't you ever forget it, ever. ATL, <laughs> <laughs> baby. ATL. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and Pastor Roland, let me just say this to you. You were the first one of all the churches that we visited, you were the first one to reach out to me during this crisis mm -hmm. as an elderly person, you know, and uh, how are you doing? Can I, can I do anything to... Uh, pick you up something from the store so you don't have to get out and expose to this thing. You know, that's because I love Mother McGraw. That's why. That's the only reason why. I love Mother <laughs> McGraw. <laughs> well, that's always why I married her because she gives me favor. Amen. <laughs> so, but I'm telling you, that experience was all we'd ever experienced. 
every time we've come to this area. And so when we chose to come down here, we thought, hey, and the spiritual climate here, oh my goodness, compared to Maryland, DC in that area, oh, it's night and day, man. Everybody's using, you know, the Christian jargon and, and giving you blessings and whatnot. So we just right. love it. We still love it here, amen. But he, he really amazed me because he really got out there in the open and just brought it out and dealt with it, says, and, and, and he was a Caucasian pastor who had a mixed congregation, but he really brought it out in the open for the entire congregation. We've got racial issues, and if we don't become cognizant of it, these things will influence us, and he gave some great examples. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, it, it, it helps us to realize that uh, if we're not proactive, it's kind of what Fred said a few minutes ago when that pastor called him to apologize for his silence. Mm -hmm. Some people said silence is golden. I said, there should no longer be any silence of the lambs. Mm -hmm. The lambs need to bleed. Mm -hmm. they, need to speak they need to speak up because we, we, we have to address this stuff and we have to address it as it is. And so one of the things that I think, I love what uh, Pastor Crane said about love. Love will turn this around. Love will truly turn this around. I also love what both them, both Fred and Pastor Crane talked about. There's a need for forgiveness on both parts. Mm -hmm. I don't know if y'all were around or you remember the, the, um, the uh, I think it was called the St. Louis. Um, Is that the foot washing? Yes. When the superintendent from the Assemblies of God. The Church of God in Christ. And the Church of God in Christ came together in the service, and the superintendent of the Assemblies of God, uh, he knelt down and watched the, the um, well, he's called bishop there in the Church of God in Christ, washed his feet, asked for forgiveness of what happened back in the 1906 when the Azusa Street revival took place, and shortly after that, the Assemblies of God gathered together to to actually get credentialed. I did that my master's at Southeastern on that, and uh, on, on uh, William Seymour. And I did a lot of research as a result of that and came to find out that uh, the bishop of the Church of God in Christ had to credential all of the Caucasian pastors who formed the Assemblies of God, but could and was present on that Arkansas, in that Arkansas site in 1914, Mm -hmm. and, but could not participate because of the Jim Crow laws at that time. And that's what divided them and caused the Church of God in Christ and the Assemblies of God to remain divided. Uh, the Assemblies of God took the rural areas. The Church of God in Christ took the inner cities. Both of the largest two Pentecostal organizations, all because of a racial law. Well, it really wasn't a law, but it was just a culture. The Jim right. Crow. So as a result of that, I, I, I applauded that, that superintendent when he did that, because you see, that's what it's going to have to take. Uh, we're going to have to love, but love is going to have to spill over more mm -hmm. towards the weaker. That's the why I made that reference to 1 Peter 3, 7. It has to spill over more towards the weaker, and it, 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 and it comes out in some practical ways and how we deal with the African-Americans within our church individually, because as a result of that, uh, and our action as pastors is going to make a huge difference. And that's what you're referring to. You were basically, uh, if I could say so, Jason, you know, you was, you was coming from the other perspective, you know, you was only seeing it from your side. <laughs> but when you, when you brought in your team and you saw they showed you another side of it, and you was able to understand it. And that's what I'm trying to communicate. There must be more of this kind of dialogue so we begin to understand each other. And if we can do that and lean towards seeking to understand and not being understood, then guess what? We're gonna make a huge difference if we can get this mm -hmm. into become a, a movement from within us. Amen. One of the mm -hmm. things that, that I'm seeing a lot of my colleagues in ministry, my African-American leaders and pastors saying over the last 48 hours is this, that they want the voice of the Caucasian leaders to rise. 
Yep. And I think it has to be more than Caucasian leaders putting a quote from Martin Luther King on their Facebook. What, 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 what is, when they're asking for the voice of Caucasian leaders and pastors <clears throat> to rise, what does that mean? What is the heart of that request? Could y'all explain that? I know for me, um, again, I can't move away from we are the family of God. Mm -hmm. um, naturally, we understand that. Naturally, whatever one's, whatever one's ethnicity is, race is, tribal background is, we all understand the concept of family. When I was in high school, there was a, um, oh, I better change their, their last name. <laughs> there was the Johnson family. <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah. yeah, yeah, the Johnson. I, I don't know any Johnsons back in high school, so I'm safe. The Johnson family. <laughs> and this family had a, I think they had maybe like six brothers and one sister. Mm -hmm. And this family was known they could fight. <laughs> and I'm so glad that I was friends with one of the brothers. <laughs> <laughs> but what I noticed was that if someone, come on, y'all know where I'm going. Come on, church. That's right, that's right. On pick with one of the family members, the family members would respond on the one's behalf. Mm -hmm. Amen. And so if you tell me, white brother, white sister, white friend, white pastor, white superintendent, if you tell me we are a part of the family and you see me or someone represented in your congregation or in your district, or even someone you may know that's getting mistreated, disenfranchised, treated wrongfully, and you say nothing, your silence is indirectly saying we are not a part of the family. Mm -hmm. My prayer is that our white brothers and sisters, that their voice, and please hear these words I'm using, their voice would be just as loud or louder than our voice in reference to being oppressed and mistreated. So that's kind of how I, I view it. Good. Excellent. I think the part of the... Um, to go to your question again, uh, Pastor Jason, is that um, our, our Caucasian pastors have to become, when the, when the guys are asking them to be more vocal, they need them to become very much like that superintendent. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is a hard thing to do, but this is what God calls us to do. Take on the sins of your forefathers. Mm. Okay, you, you got, you, you know, you, maybe you're not even feeling that way, but intercessory prayer means stepping in the gap on behalf, yeah. taking on their sins. And, 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 you know, that's what you see in the Old Testament when these intercessors would pray. They would repent of their forefathers' sins and whatnot. They would take it on, literally take it on. And if there's an area of transparency, that can come up in your life where you think you were silent or you think that you uh, deliberately did something, repent publicly to mm -hmm. your congregation. I think in doing that, uh, taking a stand, for example, in these situations, that's what Frank, uh, uh, Fred is referring to, where you're no longer silent, but you're taking a stand. One of the things that really blessed me when the, uh, when the, um, I think it's Ahmad, Ahmad Aubrey situation mm -hmm. came out. Georgia. My, my assistant superintendent, uh, what a wonderful brother. Uh, and, and, and he's always been a wonderful brother. I'm not saying that he just became a wonderful brother because of what he did. <laughs> <laughs> when I planted in my church, he, he was one of the only pastors that helped me. He supported us monthly. He also took me in, and, and we were allowed to do all of our new converts, baptisms in his church. And so he's always been there, a friend of mine in, in ministry, and, and we, we served on the board together, okay, as executive presbyters, then he became the assistant superintendent. So uh, 
he put out a post on Facebook mm -hmm. about how enraged he was about what had happened to Ahmad, mm -hmm. and uh, and just this should not be seen among us in the church. And he took a real strong stand, and uh, I reached out to him and thanked him because mm -hmm. that is what is necessary, you see. And and I think that's what when when these pastors ask for more Caucasian pastors to to make something vocal and vo they, they need to do these things visibly, publicly, and so that uh, it really will help to heal these wounds and slowly chip away at that chip, slowly take it away. Like uh, Pastor Crane said, this is a process, That's but right. every little bit helps, every little bit helps. And and I can tell you, uh, we, 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 if, if I can close with this, um, I would say this. Um, this is a lot more urgent yeah. than many of us realize. Yes, sir. Yes, when sir. I made reference to the 60s, because of what I'm seeing in 2020, this is the way it starts. Wow. I saw it start. I lived through it. And little by little, you see these outbursts, and then the next you know, it's sweeping a nation. My God. And, and nobody wants to be the leader to lead through those difficult times. Mm -hmm. Because people start taking sides. That's right. Never be taking sides. So what we're doing, and I was so thankful that you guys asked me to do this, be a part of this, because what we're doing can actually change a lot of hearts. That's right. And that's what we need to do so that we can prevent what the enemy wants to do and bring destruction to our nation. Amen.